All right, witches, demons, and Owl House adoring humans, we've got some pretty massive reveals to talk about after Emperor Bellos' past was laid bare before us in Hollow Mind. Steal yourself, because we've got some grim topics to walk through. You're watching Whitney Vision, and this is my breakdown of Hollow Mind. This is your spoiler warning! If you haven't seen Season 2, Episode 16 of The Owl House yet, hit pause on this video and come back once you've escaped the terror of Bellos' mind. Now, on to the breakdown. Who oh boy, where do we even start with this one, folks? This episode was such a masterpiece all around. Not only did it confirm some major fan theories, like Hunter being a Grimwalker, but the emotional impact of each reveal was fully earned and poignant. Then there's the fact that this episode went the extra mile to fit in a Bellos backstory. Seriously, revealing the history of Bellos through environmental background details is a masterclass showcase in storytelling. And I can only imagine how many future storytellers are going to see it and carry that inspiration into their careers. Mark my words, 20 years from now, a wave of auteur filmmakers are going to cite this episode of The Owl House as foundational to their approach to writing. And the world will be better for it. Being an internet theorist, this sort of easter egg hunting is exactly why I love making videos. So let's abuse the zoom function in my editing program and piece out everything we've learned. Calling back to the magical mechanisms of Season 1's Understanding Willow, Luz and Hunter find themselves trapped within the mind of Emperor Bellos. When they first enter, they find themselves in a false mindscape. It's ornate, gilded, and paints a facade that Bellos shares with the Boiling Isles, that he is the hero that saved the world from wild magic. There are six visible memories on display here, some of which we get to see explored later on in the episode. First, we see the revisionist history of Dead Wardian Bellos leading the citizens of the Boiling Isles to safety, offering protection and guidance from the terror attacks of wild witches. Next, we see Bellos introducing his coven system to the witches of the Boiling Isles, subjecting them to his rule. What's interesting to note here is that the magic ore Bellos is casting looks similar to the energy used by the Collector in Knock Knock Knockin' on Hootie's Door. It could just be a sort of flare magic, since Dell also uses a firework popper in that episode. But there might possibly be a connection here, especially since Bellos and the Collector would have been teaming up at this point. The next panel brings us to modern Bellows, as he's knighting Hunter as the Golden Guard. In the background, you can see the coven heads, including Scooter Crane, the bard coven head who retired, opening up a position for Rain Whispers. Hunter notes that Darius looks particularly upset. As we've recently learned, Darius was close to the previous Golden Guard, so it isn't surprising that Darius would feel unsettled by Bellows anointing a new version of the GG. Based on Darius's temperament towards Hunter at the start of any sport in a storm, I do think that the complexity of emotions Darius is feeling here stems from a place of mourning his mentor, and less from a place of protecting Hunter. That's not to say that Darius wouldn't find the disposable nature of the Golden Guards disconcerting, but I don't think he turns a page on caring for Hunter until Hunter shows that he is more than a pawn of Bellows. Like I said, Darius has got to be grappling with a complex set of emotions here, which is wild because you can barely tell that he's frowning. Jumping across the hall, we have two very generic portraits of modern Emperor Bellas. The middle frame seems to be depicting him displaying his prominent power as Emperor. The other portrait, further down the hall, has Bellos watching a fire raid. Based on our best attempts to get a clean view of this scene, it appears that Bellos is peering into a fireplace within his castle. Note the witch statues that you can see throughout Bellos' keep. Bellos looking into the flame brings to mind how Bellos has previously used pyromancy, or fire scrying, to share with the coven heads his plans for the Day of Unity. Those flames were a different color, but we don't have much else to go on for the reason why this is a notable part of Bellos' mindscape. My guess would be that Bellows tells the Isles that he communicates with the Titan through flames. Lastly, we have a painting labeled Triumph Over Wild Magic, which depicts the events of Young Blood Old Souls. This painting is pretty obviously the indicator to the viewers and Luz that Bellows' lies even seep down into his subconscious. Luz and Hunter are eventually thrown into what they call Bellows' true mindscape, with this mindscape tearing like a cheap thin wallpaper to symbolize how it only appears to be reality set in stone. While there are some huge reveals that overshadow this short sequence, this concept of a false mindscape actually brings about a lot of questions that can give us better insight into Ember Bellows. For starters, why is it even there? Whenever we talk about how Philip lies and twists history, it's usually coming from a place of manipulation and propaganda. But here, in Bellos' mind, he presumably has no one to trick but himself. So either this false mindscape is A, how Bellos actually perceives his story, B, the lies he tells himself like a method actor blending into a role to deceive others, or C, it's a measure of self-defense. If the first avenue is true, then we get to see an authentic look at how Bellos' mind ticks. 
We know from later on in the episode that he has spent centuries working on a plan to hunt and exterminate witches, so the gleeful way he frames his lies would be indicative of how much evil is within him. He's proud that he's outsmarted and tricked the Boiling Isles. This is a narcissistic display of how brilliant his plan is. And by labeling this picture triumph over wild magic, Bellows has already calculated in his head that he's beaten the bad girl coven. His triumph was the moment he stripped Ida and Lilith of their innate magic. If true, he might be expecting another showdown with Ida, not preparing for the new tricks up her sleeves. On the other hand, if this is a purposeful display of false memories, that would imply that Bellows has built an internal self-defense mechanism to trick any magic trying to pry around in his mind. These sort of eternal sunshine of the spotless mind memory diving spells don't seem to be extremely rare magic. So as Emperor, even if you ruled benevolently, it would be a wise idea to ensure that you had some level of defense against psychic snooping. Obviously, these defenses aren't great, but if someone just got a glimpse into Bellos' skull, this might be enough to trick them into accepting his lies at face value. Possibly if a band of spies were popping in and out to do some recon, or if an arbiter was using memory tweezers to verify a story, they might leave with the wrong information. Alternatively, it's just like Luz suggests, that this might just be the wallpaper to his mind, the stories at the forefront of his brain that he constantly has to refer to in order to keep his ruse afloat. Down in Bellos' true mind, we get quite the story painted for us by all of these background images. We finally get to see Philip's brother. Although, like an angry ex, Bellos has scratched his face out of several images of the two together. In Understanding Willow, we learn that damaging a memory in the mindscape physically alters it. It stands to reason that either purposefully or indirectly, Bellos' original memories with his brother have degraded in some manner. It seems very purposeful, so my assumption is that the inner Bellows has torn away at these memories, much like the inner Willow did with her memories of Amity. Using these images, along with what we've learned in Yesterday's Lie and the journal entries of Philip Wittebane, we're finally able to fully piece together a coherent timeline for Bellows. It hasn't been confirmed that this is his name, but for simplicity, we're gonna call the blonde brother Caleb after Hunter's alter ego in any sport in a storm. The Wittebane brothers were born in the 1600s, and were part of a British colony in Gravesfield, Connecticut. Growing up, they did what all white children of the time did, churn butter and practice their pitchforking technique. The older brother would carve toys for his sibling, including the creepy wooden prototype Bellows Mask. It appears to being raised in their puritanical society glamorized witch hunting, and the pair would pretend to be witch hunters. They would even set rope traps and wear pointy hats. As the boys grew up, they would try to hunt down a witch themselves. Note the pitchfork in Caleb's hand. Enamored by magic, the brothers follow the witch into the demon realm. But what's interesting here is that there seems to be a huge gap between this memory and the next. Philip is around Luz's age here, and in the next possible slide, he's a young adult. This leads me to think there's another juicy nugget of backstory yet to be revealed. If we take Philip's journal at face value, his venture into the demon realm was a one-way trip. But based on this historic account, placing a cardinal on Caleb's shoulder and a glyph in Philip's hands, they must have spent a period of time with the witch, learning about magic before leaving Gravesfield. It's also worth bearing in mind that the next time we see Philip and Caleb together in a memory, they are both adults. This tells me that young Caleb willingly went to the demon realm with his witch friend, and Philip followed, likely out of concern for his brother's safety. During this period, somehow the two were separated, leaving Philip to explore and navigate the demon realm on his own. According to his journal entries, Philip would enter through Eclipse Lake, which would still be located at the knee, thanks to a mixture of Titan's blood and the lake's water. Caleb, unaware that his brother followed him, carved out a life for himself in the Boiling Isles and would fall in love with the witch. I believe that this witch was a Clawthorn ancestor. In this silhouette, she looks similar to Ida from Echoes of the Past. Also, she looks like she's pregnant in this image as well, so it's entirely possible that Caleb sired a bloodline before his death. Also, Gwendolyn has mentioned that the Clawthorns come from a long line of palisman carvers, and Caleb has shown proficiency with woodwork. While Caleb was living a life of sin, Philip was chronicling his findings in his journal and spent his time seeking out the means to return back to the human realm. Based on Philip's facial hair and the time window given in his Eclipse Lake entry, Philip spent five years in the Isles before returning to Eclipse Lake to find Titan's blood. This leads me to believe that he was separated from Caleb for about as long. Because this period is a bit of a mystery, it's hard to say for certain how Philip spent his first years in the Isles, but it seems he picked up his palisman drinking habit during this time. If I had to make a guess, Philip started to experiment with magic and learned ways to exploit the Isles. Like Luz, he was probably given a glyph or two from the Isles, before his true nature was revealed 
and the Isles worked to hide the glyphs from him. Eventually, he'd develop an addiction to magical power and would start luring witches into traps so that he could steal their palismen. When Philip eventually found Caleb and his partner, he was enraged to see his former witch-hunting brother living happily with a witch. Using his newfound palisman powers, Philip attacked, possibly believing that he could save his brother from the witch's enchantment. To his surprise, Caleb welcomed him with open arms and accepted him even within his monstrous form. Now, the next painting seems to be part of the same sequence, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that between these two memories lies the diary entry, where Philip went to Eclipse Lake with a party of adventurers and returned as the lone survivor. Firstly, because this is cited to happen five years after he first entered the Isles. Secondly, because his map from Elsewhere and Else When very clearly depicts him and Caleb together. And thirdly, because this would explain the two sets of colonial footprints. Speaking of the footprints, I want to take a second to rewind and reanalyze this frame with what we've learned from Season 2B so far. If you notice, there seems to be five sets of individual prints. Two sets of ye old pointy-toed prints, a set of bare feet, and two sets of footprints that look more modern. This was a bit confusing when Eclipse Lake first aired, but now that we know that time travel's at play, I think that this might explain things. I don't want to lean on time travel for theories, but if the footprint fits… Yeah, this footprint looks like it'd be fitting for Luz's flat white sneakers. I think that we're being led to believe that these footprints were part of the same trip to Eclipse Lake, but my theory is that Caleb and his witch partner were lured to Eclipse Lake by Philip, and shortly after, a time-traveling Luz with another member of the BGC followed behind. Eclipse Lake is clearly an important landmark that connects the human and demon realms, so I think we're going to see more of the showdown between Philip and Caleb firsthand at this location. If I had to venture a guess, Luz might be forced to time travel in order to acquire Titan's blood from the lake now that Ida and King have used the last of her fuel home. This does leave the question of who the last pair of prints belonged to. At first, I thought the bare feet could belong to the Wild Witch, as a sort of symbol of the witch's connection to nature in the Isles, but we can see in a later painting that she is wearing boots. I think this confirms this pair is hers. They may look more modern, but that could just be because they're rounded at the toe. So who do the bare feet belong to? Well, that's really up in the air, although if I had to guess, it'd be either Hunter or Amity depending on how the writers want to spin the story. Obviously, Hunter getting to see his original counterpart fall to Bellos would give him another heartbreaking story beat. But if this somehow ends up being a one-way trip home for Luz, involving Amity is mandatory. Regardless of my theory, at some point Philip will betray his brother and force him into a duel that will result in Caleb's death. It is interesting that Caleb dies in a position reminiscent of how the Titan lays. No, I don't think that Caleb is the Titan, but I do think that this draws a symbolic connection to him and the inherent magic of the Boiling Isles. Especially if Caleb ends up being a Clawthorn ancestor. His side of the family tree would represent palisman keepers and the natural magic systems that Philip has betrayed and killed. Also, look at Philip's reflection in that dagger. He looks so cold and accomplished in this moment. Truly unsettling. It looks like after Caleb dies, his partner chases out Philip with her magic, possibly hitting him with a curse. From here, we see Philip begin his transition to Bellows. His palisman drinking problem intensifies, and he starts carving glyphs into his skin with the same knife that killed his brother. It's at this point in Philip's timeline that he meets Luz and Lilith and tricks them into helping him gain his connection to the Collector. It isn't long after he's punched out by the coolest auntie with the coldest right hook that he fully begins to transition himself from Philip to Bellows. I say this because when Luz and Hunter visit his memory of tricking wild witches to the nine hues of coven magic, the gathering townsfolk are the same exact ones from elsewhere and elsewhere. This baby hasn't even aged. As part of this process, Bellus adopts a more sinister mask, and I can't stress enough how metal this is. He carves his own ears. Look at it, you can actually see the slab of skin he pulls off in that pan. He does this to blend in better with the witches, by the way, which is a bit odd considering that his whole uniform would obscure his telltale lobes anyways. Also, since we see that Bellows has a grown Grimwalker on hand at this point, I think that we can infer that Grimwalkers don't grow and age like normal humans or witches. The first blueprints we see for Grimwalkers do show them growing in stages, so I don't think that they're exactly 3D printed, but they could be rather quick to cook up. I actually think that this image here is how they're born. I know a lot of people are interpreting this photo as Bellows drowning a golden guard in sand, but this looks like Philip's lair, and this tube looks like a mechanism that would pump air or some sort of ingredient necessary for animating a clone. Also, unrelated, but what is this? Is he just holding something in his hand, or is that straight up Philip's old face? Did Bellows shed his head? During this time, we see that Bellows has started to use a prototype of his techno staff. 
As I've theorized before, I think this is powered by glyph magic that utilizes light glyphs like computer chips, all thanks to Luz. Moving on to the next memory, we see that Belos has destroyed a town on the knee and blamed wild witches for it. If you recall, in Adventures in the Elements, there's a set of mysterious runes on the knee. Well, they're not so mysterious now. Here, Belos commands a fresh golden guard, made distinct to us due to wearing a different neck collar. Using some sort of technology, Belos has this golden guard brand the Willing Witches. As we know, these brands aren't exactly doctor recommended, and these early test runs left witches in a comatose state. Sure, they might not be dead, but they are being abandoned in a blizzard, so Belos is racking up his body count super nonchalantly. From here, we have another big gap, this time for what must be centuries. After all, Belos only came to power as emperor 50 years ago. This means he spent about 300 years perfecting his technology, swaying witches to his side, and abusing slash murdering his golden guards. According to my count, there have been at least 18 golden guards over the years. Somehow, these puppets always find a way to defy Belos, leading to their cyclical slaughtering. It appears that Belos likes to shake up how he disposes of his golden guards, too. Some are petrified and some are laser blasted. When Belos has his conversation with the Collector, the Collector accuses him of enjoying this process, and honestly, I think that the Collector's right. Belos is sadistic in his punishments, and he actively is leading Hunter on a tour of trauma in this episode. Yes, Belos was using Hunter and Luz to lure out and distract the collective amalgamation of Palisman within his soul, but he was also showing Hunter memories that could only lead him down a path that would turn him. Bellows claims that Hunter is safe as long as he does what he's told, but Bellows immediately deems him another failed Grimwalker clone when Hunter simply pieces together the truth. Hunter doesn't oppose him at all, he simply just asks, it wasn't wild magic that tore our family apart, was it? This brings us to not only the theme of this episode, but what seems to be the theme of Owl House as a whole, finding the strength to question and reassess your core beliefs. At the start of the episode, King gives us the theme summary. No one wants to think they've wasted their life following the wrong person. Here, we see that both Luz and Hunter have to grapple with this, but Caleb also had to overcome his learned upbringing. This contrasts with Bellos, who has spent multiple lifetimes following a backwards belief system. Ultimately, this belief is likely going to be Bellos' fatal flaw, and will bite him when he's no longer a use to the Collector. Like Hunter, he'll be discarded. Speaking of the Collector, I gotta say, I was not predicting we'd get an evil trickster god. Super cool. This video is already pushing it in terms of length, so I think I'm gonna hold my Collector theories for another video. That said, there's been a big swell of talk about Luz and the Collector merging into one being, and I just wanna say, I'm part of that camp. This shot compared to the teaser Dana drew had me instantly drawing connections between the two. But there's also a metric ton of sun and moon motifs that might be foreshadowing this merger. Particularly, these Eclipse Lake maps might be hinting at something big. Before we go, this week's hidden code is Skies, making the secret poem of the season read, Seething seas and puppet strings, he no longer dreams of kings, as above rush darkened skies. We've only got five words left this season, and now we know that the last line will likely rhyme with skies. My guess is gonna be, from below uncovers his prize. Ending in rise or goodbyes are also strong contenders at this point. Those are just some of my theories about Bellows, but I want to know what you guys think in the comments. Like and subscribe to Whitney Vision and stay tuned for more breakdowns and theories. I'm Scarlet Wit, and you're watching Whitney Vision.